many games struggle to find the perfect balance between story and gameplay. Usually one aspect will dominate the other, the neglected one being far less enjoyable. Occasionally a heavy rain comes along with the gameplay taking a back seat to the strong narrative, but more often than not games are focused on the control given to the player and the freedom to execute those controls. It was exciting then to find that not only did Deus Ex Mankind Divided excel in its approach to gameplay, but the narrative was one of the more compelling I've seen in a game. This backdrop of a futuristic society ravaged by civil unrest was particularly interesting because it deals with a lot of the same issues we are dealing with today. Segregation, discrimination, terrorism, and social engineering just to name a few. And I found it refreshing to experience a game that's built upon these serious and mature topics. But as good as the story is, in my opinion the gameplay is even better. It is so refined, with exceptional level design. You can truly play whatever role you wish. You can go tactical stealth and silently take down every enemy. You can mow everyone down with an assortment of firearms and weaponized augments. Or if you prefer not to engage in combat at all, you can sneak your way around the world taking advantage of the meticulously designed interactive environments. Combine this with the freedom to handle any, and I do mean any, situation in a multitude of ways, and this game is simply one of the best action RPGs I've ever played. On top of it all, stunning cinematography and an atmospheric, synthesized score make this game one of the most hyper-stylized games I've ever played, and one of the best neo-noir, futuristic works of art I've ever experienced. But it's not merely style over substance. The characters, both main and supporting, are unique and alive. Even the nameless citizens of Prague have depth you normally don't see in an open world game. You don't even need to hear a single line of dialogue to understand the desperation and serious moral issues these characters face. These are important issues of our time, and even if Eidos Montreal did all this by accident, which I highly doubt, I commend them for creating a parallel universe containing such issues and parlaying them into this futuristic cyberpunk RPG action game. Now as compelling as the story is, when you factor in all of the decision-based missions and interesting characters you meet along the way, there are a few small development issues and one major problem that cannot be ignored, and in my opinion it keeps me from considering this game one of the best I've ever played and a must own. But I'll save that major problem for the end, if you know what I'm saying. So if all this so far intrigues you and makes you want to go out and experience it for yourself, you might want to stop watching now. I'm going to spoil everything, both the narrative and the gameplay, the latter of which is much better experienced for yourself because once you know how to take advantage of all the mechanics, it takes some of the fun out of it. Once you select your difficulty and set your options, you are introduced to this world through a cinematic recap of the events of the previous game, Human Revolution, narrated by the main character, Adam Jensen. Admittedly, this section is too long and excessively detailed. Its helpfulness to a new player like myself is cancelled out by the fact that too many proper names, locations, and events are listed to the point of information overload. In my opinion, a shorter, more concise summary would have been sufficient enough to be able to understand your mission in the game. My summary would be like this. Adam Jensen is a former Detroit cop whose ex-girlfriend Megan develops a scientific breakthrough allowing people to physically cope with their augments without the use of neuropazine. Wait, what? Oh yeah, in the future, medical science has come so far as to allow people to install computerized mechanical augmentations. But these augments are not simply prosthetic limbs that give the ability to walk to someone otherwise disabled, but they also give people superhuman abilities, like jumping several stories high and punching through brick walls. The augmented person would need the drug neuropazine, though, for their bodies to physically withstand the procedure and their subsequent life as an aug. Augments became extremely controversial for reasons previously stated. They disrupted human evolution, gave people unfair advantages, were only available to the wealthy, and posed a serious threat to people without augments. Like how could a normal human cop stop a deranged augment from slaughtering a hundred people? Before her presentation, Megan and her team are attacked by augmented terrorists. Jensen tries to intervene but is mortally injured with Megan being presumed dead. He undergoes life-saving surgery, leaving him heavily augmented in order to sustain his life. Sometime later, the quote-unquote father of augmentations, Hugh Darrow, activated a universal signal sending all augmented individuals into a psychotic killing spree, leaving millions dead, known as the Aug Incident, or simply the Incident. 
Darrow claimed he did this because he saw augments as a means of positively advancing human life, but instead they became a tool used by the wealthy to establish further control and oppression to the rest of society. As a result, the aug population has been vilified ever since, causing massive fear on the part of non-augmented humans, or naturals. Augs have become segmented off in society, and augmentations are almost universally seen as a threat to humanity. Politicians are working towards anti-aug legislation, and terror attacks from both naturals and augs against the other are commonplace. Thus, here we are, with mankind divided. Two years later, Adam is now part of an Interpol-sponsored anti-terrorism task force known as TF-29, their goal being to prevent any further instances of terror from occurring. Adam must do so while navigating this post-incident world filled with fear, discrimination, and hatred. Again, if all of this has piqued your interest and made you want to give it a go, this is your last chance to stop the video because now we move into the spoilers. After the introduction, you assume control of Jensen during a mission to Dubai, where you are tasked with intercepting an illegal arms deal involving augmented mercenaries and extracting undercover TF-29 member Arun Singh. Right off the bat, two things stood out to me. One is that the dialogue between Jensen and fellow TF-29 agent McCready reveals the deep-seated hatred between humans and Augs. Not gonna go all wonky on us now, Hansa. Are ya? Well, if I do, McCready, I guarantee you'll never see it coming. In this case, because three of McCready's men were killed during the incident. The other is that you get to make your first choice. This one concerning whether you're going to be lethal or non-lethal during the mission. During my first playthrough on Give Me Deus Ex, I made the decision to go through the entire game without killing a single NPC using the rifle, stun gun, and non-lethal takedowns and augments while playing the nice guy during dialogue choices. My second playthrough on Give Me a Challenge, I used lethal takedowns and augments, automatic weapons, and killed every single person I could while being a total dick to people during dialogue choices. The third playthrough on I Never Asked for This, also known as permadeath mode, where death means your save file gets permanently erased and you must start from scratch, I tried to avoid combat at all costs, using stealth augments and taking advantage of the movement and hacking mechanics. All three were viable options too, I finished the game using all three styles, adding to the diversity and freedom given to the player. This being my first Deus Ex game, I treated the Dubai mission as a linear level, moving from cover to cover to take out enemies and advance to the end, looking straight ahead of me the entire way. But after the prologue, I immediately noticed the levels do not have to be played this way. In fact, they shouldn't be played this way. You have to completely be aware of your surroundings, which includes looking above and below you too. Here you are introduced to your augments and how they work. You begin with certain augments preloaded into your system, each one requiring energy replaced with biocells in order to function. Some of these augments activate automatically, like the Icarus landing which prevents damage from falling at any height. Others must be mapped to the D-pad and activated, meaning you must select which four augments you're going to choose. Biocells are consumables found in the world around you, and you can even choose augments that allow for more energy storage and can replace energy lost more quickly. This is the game's progression system. Experience points earned from combat, exploration, and completing objectives allows you to level up and earn praxis points which are used to purchase augments. You can select any number of different types of augments based on your playstyle, from stealth augs like invisibility, to remote hacking, to combat augs that slow time. You can also choose augs that aid in movement around the world, so you can jump to extraordinary heights, punch through walls, and lift heavy objects. This system is the central part of the game, the defining factor of your experience, and you will see tons of examples of how AUGs will open new doors, literally, giving you access to otherwise unnavigable areas. The inventory system is introduced here as well, and it's here you can do much more than just manage your items, but also upgrade them and craft new ones. If you find a hollow site and want to equip it to your combat rifle, if you're about to die and don't have any hypo stems but have enough crafting parts to make one, or if your 10mm pistol just doesn't pack enough punch and wish to upgrade that specific attribute, all of these tasks can be executed in your inventory. The hacking mechanic is introduced as well, with terminals and computers protecting doors and safes all over the environment. After looking at some pretty unintuitive tutorials, you get to hack your first terminal. AUGs will allow you to hack at higher levels and will also make it harder for the CPU to detect you, 
Software found around the world acts as one-time power-ups, allowing you to hack a node completely undetected, speed up the capture rate, or even nuke a data node to capture it instantly. Now the interesting thing you'll notice is that each terminal and computer has the option to enter a code or password to unlock it so that you don't have to hack it at all. Codes and passwords can be found on pocket secretaries on downed bodies, hidden in lockers, or just lying around. More frequently, codes and passwords are found in emails, and when found, they're stored in your database so that when the time comes, you can simply enter it and bypass hacking altogether. One of many examples of having more than one option to approach the situation. Now by this point I noticed, and I'm sure you did too, there are so many facets of the game running parallel to one another at all times, which makes it difficult to categorize Mankind Divided, and simply throw it into a basket and give it a style. It's an RPG, it's a first person shooter, it's an action adventure, it's a futuristic thriller, it's a cyberpunk drama, it's rooted in augmentations, movement mechanics, hacking, and inventory management. There are even more aspects too, as you'll later see, but it's worth mentioning that because of the diversity and freedom to approach every situation however you see fit, combined with the art direction and storytelling, this game captivated me and I could not put it down until I played through to the end. After you advance to the end, you see Agent Singh making the buy with a contact named Shepard, and the deal is ambushed by gold mask Augs who intend to steal the weapons. You can choose what to do next, either fight the Augs off or race to the helicopter to ground it, preventing the Augs from stealing the arms. The second time through, I gun down everyone in a matter of minutes, using the Smart Vision Aug to see my targets in the Sandstorm, one of the cooler sequences during the prologue. Once you ground the chopper, you are segued into one of the best opening credit sequences in a game I've seen. A chilling look into this post-incident world filled with naturals and augs seemingly at war with one another. Artificial eyes to prosthetic lips. From molecular sized computers. Human controlled evolution available to all. Scenes of horror on the streets of Detroit. Madness has gripped mechanically augmented people. Shanghai, Los Angeles, Ankara, Dubai. People are dying out there. Millions of people. The search for survivors in Panchea has been downgraded to a recovery mission. The Czech Republic leads a growing list of countries calling for the relocation of its augmented citizens. It's a new world, Adam. It's afraid of people like us. Bust into safe and secure. Separate industries closed its doors. I didn't think it would end with the AUG incident, did you? Then you get a glimpse of the Illuminati talking about the incident in Dubai. It is revealed they orchestrated the intercept and employed the gold mask mercs, and they voiced their frustrations that TF-29 halted the attack, and affirmed the AUG incident caused a schism in society, but they assure themselves their mission of maintaining control remains intact. It's also revealed the Illuminati will apply political and financial pressure to ensure the passage of the Human Restoration Act, United Nations proposed legislation that forces all AUGs to be implanted with a control chip and heavily augmented people to be downgraded. To help ensure its passage, the Illuminati activates a sleeper cell, which we later discover to be a segment of the Augmented Rights Coalition, or ARC, led by the radical Viktor Marchenko. So Jensen arrives in Prague at Ruzika Station to meet his friend Vega, a member of the Juggernaut Collective, a group of hackers dedicated to stomping out corruption, specifically the Illuminati. Vega is suspicious of the events in Dubai, specifically TF-29's involvement and the responsibility of its director, Jim Miller. She believes TF-29 is an Illuminati front and that Miller sent them to Dubai to be witnesses to the ambush so they would escape suspicion. So she gives Jensen a whisper chip to implant in Miller's neural subnet, or NSN, a device that allows people to communicate privately in cyberspace. Before they manage to leave, the station is bombed in yet another terrorist attack, destroying the station and claiming more lives. You wake up in your apartment to find your AUGs are malfunctioning due to the attack, so you call up Dr. Vaclav Kohler to fix you up. Problem is, Dr. Kohler is holed up in his workshop, surrounded by Diwali henchmen. So you get your first objective in the game, make your way to Dr. Kohler. This is where the game properly begins, but before we get into it, I want to point out the first of many examples of the stunning art direction. The way the light shines through the window as you open the blinds, 
and Jensen stares out into this mess of a world he's about to embark, all while the haunting, synthesized score reverberates in the background, really sets the tone for the next several hours. The city of Prague acts as a hub between trips to other locations, but it's where you'll be spending most of your time. You can see the segregation of Vogs from the rest of society in multiple aspects. Benches that are marked for naturals only, police acting aggressively towards Augs, stopping and detaining them at every corner. The train stations are the best examples as humans and Augs have separate lines and checkpoints, and even ride their own train cars. It's interesting because if you, as an Aug, go through the wrong line, you too are stopped by police and given a hard time. And if you ride the wrong car, aside from having the naturals on board give you glaring looks of disapproval, you're again stopped by police when you reach the station. You can even come across a cop forcing an AUG to get off the naturals only bench and watch them go sit on a non-designated bench. I thought this was an impressive dedication to world design because it further immerses the player into this post-incident environment of division. At this point the combat introduced in Dubai becomes much freer to the player. The shooting mechanics have multiple layers to them because of the diversity of the enemies you'll be facing. Police, for example, wear body armor and have helmets, so armor-piercing rounds are much more effective than standard ammo. If you're facing robot units like drones or heavy mechs, you can use EMP ammo or an EMP grenade to neutralize them, then let loose with regular ammo. Even some humans will wear mechanized suits and must be neutralized by EMP to be engaged. Attempting a takedown without disabling them will have a bad result. And since we're living in a world with AUGs, it's best to EMP them as well, otherwise they will be using a full arsenal of augments like the ones you have, making the fight much more difficult. Like I said before, how you choose to engage in combat is your choice. Stealth, run and gun, and avoiding combat entirely are all viable options. I alluded to the takedown mechanic earlier, and I think it's one of the most unique forms of contextual takedowns I've seen in a game. If you're playing kill free, like my first playthrough, Non-lethal takedowns will knock enemies unconscious and can be revived later by other enemies. Or you can use a lethal takedown and stab them with a nano blade. But either way, if an enemy's body is discovered, it will raise an alarm. So you must drag enemies out of sight to avoid detection. The other cool aspect is that if you perform a takedown from behind cover, you will drag that enemy into cover with you. So it will be basically impossible to be seen by an NPC, which made my stealth playthrough a dream. I thought it was an amazing design element. Now you see the gameplay take center stage. You're given the objective to meet Dr. Kohler, but how you do it is completely up to you. When you approach the entrance, you'll be turned away by the Diwali. At first I was confused because it wasn't at all clear what to do next, but that's the point. You can go to a checkpoint and get turned away again by a corrupt cop named Dramir, which leads you to a side quest. You can use the Clipspringer Og to jump above the checkpoint leading to an apartment and crawl through a vent to get through the other side. You can rat Dramir out to another cop which will create a shootout allowing you to pass. You can stealth your way through the checkpoint using your AUGs, or of course you can just blast your way through. I chose the side quest initially and this is where I saw the dedication to storytelling. Instead of a generic fetch quest where you go explore and grab an item and bring it back to an NPC for a reward. The side missions are well thought out with interesting stories and characters. You're given another objective, but again, the freedom to approach it however you want. You have to see Dramir's document agent, but again, the way is restricted. You find Dramir and the agent are extorting Augs and must see Malena, who creates the forged documents. Again, shoot through, jump, or sneak. Your choice. In just a few instances, you can already see the deep and detailed world design at work. Exploring Prague was a completely immersive experience. It actually felt like there was nowhere I couldn't go. If I couldn't jump high enough, I could set up some objects to give me a boost. Traversing interconnected vents took me to areas I didn't intend on going to, including one instance where I explored the entire Palisade Bank without even trying to, collecting tons of helpful loot and gaining experience points. The levels are tightly concentrated. Even a small surface area can contain multiple hidden locations accessed in a multitude of ways. It's all about depth, not width. Instead of having a Los Santos to explore, where the sheer size is so large it could take several minutes to travel from one location to another, instead, this feels like there's one world on top of another, on top of another. 
When you talk to Milena, you can be as friendly or condemning as you want, but ultimately she realizes what she's been doing is extortion and agrees to stop. Except for two people who now have the opportunity to be saved from deportation to Gollum City. Arenka is a former actress suffering from a sort of dissociative identity disorder, putting on plays for inanimate objects. You can't help but pity her as she's obviously lost all touch with reality, but is trying to keep those great memories of being a renowned actress alive. When you encounter Edward, he's being robbed at gunpoint in his shop, and after taking out the assailant you learn he killed his granddaughter during the AUG incident. As a result, he hasn't spoken to his family since. He's filled with regret and remorse for his uncontrollable actions and is consumed by guilt as he still feels responsible. You give both Arenka and Edward documents from Milena, but when you go to activate them at the registration office, you only have time to authenticate one, leaving you with a choice. I chose Edward the first time because I felt sorry for him, but I felt a similar way about Arenka. The interesting thing is that later in the game, when you're inside Gollum City, you can run across and talk to the person that you didn't save, which I thought was brilliant. It added so much more depth to what could have been an otherwise generic side mission. Instead, you can actually see the choices you make in the game manifest themselves in an emotional way. If your exploration of Prague takes you into the sewers like it did me, you'll come across a strange cult with an enigmatic leader who seems to exhibit complete control over his members. When you enter the area, you too become under some sort of trance and are unable to use any of your augs. After some investigating, you learn the man is a former magician named Richard, and his old partner will give you a device to suppress his mind control, freeing his members. This one was particularly interesting to me because if you have the Cassie Aug, which analyzes speech patterns and dialogue choices to better navigate a conversation, the first time you speak to him, the analyzer tells you that Richard is a great man, and you are completely prevented from saying anything challenging or condescending. But after you break his mind control, the Aug tells you he's a desperate man, and you talk him down from his high horse with ease. As if the exploration elements and movement mechanics aren't enough to make this open world feel alive, the characters you run across certainly will. Each character model is unique, with a wide variety of voice actors, and as a result, I never felt like these people were cardboard cutouts of the same generic personality. Adding to the desperate theme, the citizens speak real dialogue that reflect the divided future you're playing in. People think I'm a stupid bum. I have a degree in art history. I envy you. I look forward to the day that I can say I used to be a cop a long time ago. That bad? If I could do it again, I... I would be a fireman. No one looks into a fire and thinks, shit, does this one really deserve it? You can just follow orders and feel good about it. I like it down here. If you don't, then you can just fuck off. I think I have tuberculosis. You can't have TB. We cure that. No, we can treat it with medicine. But when's the last time you heard of any medicine being delivered to this hellhole? <laughs> you, uh, you have some blood specks on your shirt. One step at a time. Just remember that. I know where the police are hidden. You can't just walk away from me. Please! We are brother and sister. Some characters will even give you points of interest that will lead you to certain side missions. But the example that sticks out in my mind doesn't even contain spoken dialogue. In Gollum City, I picked up a pocket secretary with a conversation between a mother and son, with the son expressing his guilt for being augmented and asking his mother for forgiveness, and the mother showing her unconditional love for her son. I never expect writing like this concerning nameless, faceless characters, so it was a pleasant surprise. Speaking of the writing and dialogue, now is probably the best time to get into the dialogue tree. A staple of any RPG, this mechanic has frustrated me before as it often has a disconnect between what the choice you make is and what the character actually ends up saying. Fallout 4 is probably the best example. What disappointed and even angered fans is the streamlining of the dialogue system, where really the only choices to make are ask for info, be sarcastic, be nice or be rude, 
taking away any real weight to your choices. Mankind Divided gets it half right. It tells you exactly, word for word, what it is you're going to say before you say it. And different choices can lead to different responses from NPCs. But admittedly, you can still progress to where you need to be no matter what you say sometimes. Take the debate with Talus Rucker. The first time, I execute the debate perfectly, and he gives me the keycard to his hidden room to obtain the evidence to this train station bombing. But the second time, I failed on purpose, killed all of the guards, but was still able to find his keycard in his desk and got the evidence anyway. One of the few examples of how the freedom of choice actually works against the game at times. The dialogue system. Hey, remember when we were supposed to go see Dr. Kohler and get our system working back again? That's what's so interesting about this game. You can lose yourself for hours exploring the world and meeting the various characters throughout. Invoking Fallout 4 once again, it's not like how the main objective of finding your son can get lost because of all the side quests and settlement building. The missions you do in Mankind Divided feel like contributions to your overall mission, to reach an end to the war between Augs and Naturals. There are some really interesting side missions too, like breaking up an illegal drug operation that's flooding the streets with neon, helping a group of hacktivists expose major corporate espionage and the cover-up of a terrorist attack, solving a murder committed by a serial killer targeting Augs, where you uncover a biotech company implanted a murderer's memories into an innocent woman, and stopping a human smuggling ring. Like I said, all feeling like you're still working towards ending the civil unrest between Naturals and Augs. So after infiltrating the bookstore and getting past the Diwali however you want, Kohler goes to work fixing you up, but in the process activates previously unknown experimental augmentations. He explains these augs overwork your system when active, so now you must manage which augs you want to use without damaging yourself. This new mechanic adds a trade-off. Activating an experimental aug means you have to deactivate another one or risk instability. It's actually cool to see what happens when you overclock. Augs can malfunction, killing you instead of your target. Your radar and user interface will skitch out on you, and your system will automatically shut down unused dogs to compensate for the instability. It's at this point the main storyline begins. You enter TF-29 headquarters to meet with Jim Miller, but first you have to install the Whisper chip in the locked NSN server room. And unsurprisingly, there are many ways to enter the room. I know I sound like a broken record, but this theme permeates the entire experience, and in my opinion separates it from other games in its genre and it's what made it so enjoyable for me. If you notice the exposed ventilation shaft right next to the room, you can find the access point and crawl through to get inside. Or you can jump through the vents above the offices which will drop you down inside the room. Or you can find the pocket secretary next to the door and deduce the location of the NSN keycard located in IT, which, again, you have to either hack the door or find the vents to get in and use it to enter but there's still a locked door you have to get through once inside, so you can either hack the terminal, use some clever climbing to jump up and over the wall, or find the password in an email on a computer in the cybercrimes office. Your choice. Once you plant the chip, you meet up with Jim Miller, who directs you to Rizika Station to investigate the bombing. When you get there, you meet Smiley, TF-29's forensic expert. The station is under lockdown by state police, so Jensen has to infiltrate to recover the storage device with the blast scan report. If you've grasped the mechanics of the game, you can easily bypass all enemies and stealthily obtain the evidence. Smiley's analysis dispatches Jensen to Gollum City, but first he must meet with TF-29 psychologist Dalera Ozen to be medically cleared. After some back and forth about Jensen's past, Delara clears him, and he's sent to extract the leader of the Augmented Rights Coalition, Talus Rucker. So you catch a ride with TF-29 pilot Chicane and depart for the Udalek Complex, a massive housing development functioning as a ghetto for exiled dogs, which they mockingly nicknamed Gollum City. You notice right away Gollum City is a despicable place, and the undocumented Augs there are treated as such. You can regularly see Augs being ridiculed or even beaten by police. You get the sense that there's no hope, no reason for trying to carry on. It's just not fair. I thought that having a baby would be the greatest day of our lives, but now... I know. I'm scared too. Is it right, do you think, for us to bring a baby into the world? 
What kind of parents would force their child to grow up in a place like this? If you're suggesting, because I think you're suggesting, I, I don't know. Your mission is to extract Dr. Rucker, leader of ARC, as he is linked to multiple terror attacks, including Ruzika. But he's held up deep in Gollum, protected by ARC soldiers, so you can infiltrate in a number of ways, receiving help from various citizens along the way. It is here you run across the radical Viktor Marchenko who warns Jensen about the influence Rucker has and the willingness of Ark to continue fighting against naturals for Aug rights. Once you reach Ark territory, you'll either sneak by or blast through to reach Dr. Rucker, and when you do, you'll have to convince him to leave with you an answer for the attacks in order to stop the needless bloodshed. During the conversation, Rucker talks about a power struggle within Ark and that certain radicals within committed the Rizika bombing and that he has the evidence to prove it. All of a sudden, Rucker begins violently convulsing and dies right in front of Jensen. So after collecting the evidence, Jensen escapes Gollum and the hostile Ark soldiers, and Chicane returns him to Prague, with Marchenko looking on. When Jensen returns, Smiley confirms his suspicions that the Ruzika bomb was built on a timing mechanism of a wristwatch made by Nomad Stanek. You confront Stanek, who admits it was his daughter Allison who orchestrated the bombing. The interesting thing here is that during my exploration of Prague, I was in Stanek's apartment and his bedroom was covered in clocks. And entering his secret room, you can read his emails which talk about his unstable daughter falling into a group of radicals. With this information, TF-29 immediately sets out to look for Allison Stanek. Meanwhile, Vega contacts you about a conversation picked up by the Whisper Chip between Miller and his boss, Joseph Manderley, where Manderley instructs Miller to frame Ark for multiple terror attacks. So you break into the NSN and uncover there is an inside man in Ark who poisoned Rucker with something called the Orchid thus leading influential billionaire Nathaniel Brown to hold a meeting with UN delegates to prevent the Human Restoration Act from passing. After this, Vega arranges a meeting between Jensen and the leader of the Juggernaut Collective, Janus, a mysterious hacker whose identity is unknown. Janus affirms the evidence Jensen has implicating Manderley and billionaire Bob Page with conspiracy to commit murder is fruit from the poisonous tree and will not hold up. Instead, Janus suggests Jensen break into Palisade Bank and enter the VersaLife corporate vault owned by Page to retrieve information on the Orchid. After the meeting, Jensen receives a call from Stanek that Allison is holed up in a place called the Church of the Machine God and that her cult followers plan to execute her in something called the Ascension. As Jensen rushes to help her, Vega calls him telling them the VersaLife vault is being moved from Palisade Bank tonight. So if Jensen is to break in, it must be now. At this point, you have a choice. Either rescue Allison and potentially solve the Rizika bombing, or break into Palisade and obtain info on the Orchid. You can't do both. No matter which one you choose, you will still be able to advance in the story, but certain actions will be prevented from occurring. On the flip side, you can still receive special benefits from the mission you complete. Rescuing Allison will reveal she made the bombs and sent hundreds more to Marchenko's base in the Swiss Alps, and she will relent that what she's been doing is wrong and give Jensen a signal jammer that will disable her bombs. Completing the heist results in uncovering a shipment of the Orchid to a facility in the Swiss Alps called Garm. Hacking the safe inside will allow you to retrieve a cure for the Orchid. So either way, Jensen will get you Kane to bring him to the Swiss Alps to try and prevent the next terror attack. Once you dropped off at the entrance, you are ambushed by Marchenko and the gold mask mercs from Dubai. Marchenko stabs you with the orchid, but you survive and wake up outside the facility. Taking advantage of the fact that he was left for dead, Jensen uses the opportunity to scout the area. The best gameplay element in this sequence is that by paying attention to your environment, you can actually bypass a large trunk of the area and sneak through by drilling a hole in the ice. When you regroup with Chicane, you head back to Prague to discover it's been placed under martial law due to rioting in Gollum after Rucker's death. For you, it means the entire city of Prague is considered a restricted area, so if you're seen anywhere outdoors, you'll be shot on sight, 
meaning you must stealth your way through everywhere you go, unless you want to take on the entire city's police at once. I found the martial law sequence the most enjoyable part of the game. The music, the cinematography, the lighting, all made this one of the coolest sections I've played in a game in a long time. With no other leads to go on, Jensen goes to Diwali territory to follow up on information found in Garm connecting Marchenko to the crime family. If you helped Eliza earlier in the game by completing her side mission, she will help you by creating a distraction. If you assisted Okar Bakavelli during the game, he will ascend to head of the Diwali and will allow you to enter the theater district unharmed. Otherwise, you will have to infiltrate it yourself. If Okar is in charge, he will tell you that Marchenko is planning to attack the Safe Harbor Convention in London, a special meeting called by Nathaniel Brown and the UN delegates. If Brown is killed, it will ensure the Human Restoration Act passes, fulfilling the Illuminati's plan. So Jensen and TF-29 set out for London to prevent the attack. When they arrive in London, they tell Brown about the planned attack, but Brown relents and says security sweeps already determined that the event was safe and that they hired extra Tarvo security personnel, even going so far as to replace the food and drinks. When Jensen infiltrates the convention, he discovers the Tarvo security team has been compromised and that Brown and the delegates are not safe. At this point, you have to take out the fake security guards and search them until you find the key card to the catering area. And when you do, you find Miller incapacitated and poisoned while the orchid has been dispersed into the champagne. Marchenko reveals himself to have Allison Stanek's bombs placed inside the surrounding residential towers to be detonated unless Jensen meets him in the exhibition hall. Now you must make a choice. Either save Brown and the delegates before they drink the orchid, or meet Marchenko and prevent the innocent loss of life. I alluded at the beginning of the video to the major problem this game's narrative has, and you start to see it here. First of all, this choice is an illusion. You can save Brown and the delegates, and stop Marchenko from detonating the bombs. You have exactly 10 minutes of real time from the moment you save one of the two parties, which is extremely simple to do. In my several playthroughs, I always accomplished it. But before you set off to do so, if you completed the heist and retrieved the antidote from the safe, you can administer it to Miller, saving his life. Two problems here. The first is that there's no real point in even contemplating whether you want to administer it or not, because if you don't, you don't get to use the antidote for any other purpose. You can't use it to save Brown after he drinks the orchid, or anyone else for that matter. It's use it or lose it. The second and even larger problem, which itself is part of the even larger major problem this game's ending has, is that it not administering the antidote leaves Miller's fate completely unknown. You can infer that he succumbs to the poison and dies, but this is never confirmed, as this is the last time you see or hear about Miller for the remainder of the game. So let's start with the delegates. Reaching them means going past several of the gold-masked Augs you faced in Dubai and Garm. When you reach the conference room, there's nothing to do. Jensen warns Brown that the champagne is spiked and he and the delegates are spared. That's it. Nothing else to do. Now you must go to the exhibition hall and confront Marchenko. There's some diversity in how you handle the situation, which I appreciated because it brought the freedom to handle gameplay full circle. If you were heavy on exploration like I was, then you found Marchenko's kill switch, and at this point you can simply activate it, killing him instantly. If you were compelling in the debate with Allison, she gave you the signal jammer which you can use to stop the bombs from detonating, leading to a fight. Or you can simply fight him. He's a difficult opponent to gun down, even on lower difficulties, as he's always using the Titan Shield Dog, making him basically invincible. So you need to EMP him in order to take him down. Once you've taken care of, or not taken care of, the objectives, the game cuts to you and Vega in your apartment, watching Eliza give her nightly newscast. The two of you discuss the aftermath of your decisions, who and who wasn't saved. Jensen demands that Vega set up a meeting to reveal Janus's true identity. The camera lingers on Eliza, giving her newscast until it's finished, 
Then you fade to black. Then the credits start to... Wait, what? That's it? <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, that's it. The game simply ends, leaving many questions completely unanswered. I told you the story has a major problem, and this is it. Set aside the fact that this game is the second in a planned trilogy. The game doesn't even end on a cliffhanger. <laughs> it just ends. Like I said before, you don't officially learn what happens to Miller without administering the antidote. You never learn who Janus is, which I found especially irritating because that was one of the few questions I had posed and wondered about throughout the entire game. I always thought it would be Vega. All the choices you made are played out in a hands-off broadcast of the nightly news. All of the compelling characters I met along the way, all of the interesting side missions I completed, the varied and alive locations, the setting, a future ravaged by civil war between augs and humans, the stunning art direction and set pieces, the music which saturated every scene, it all felt like it was for nothing. No payoff. The ending did not at all do the gameplay or narrative I experienced any justice. To make matters worse, there's a mid credit scene where it's revealed Delara, the TF-29 psychologist, is actually an Illuminati plant, and Lucius De Beers says that soon Jensen will contact Janus and in the process his identity will finally be made known so that he no longer poses a threat to their mission of complete power and control. But so what? It's simply sequel bait, and this revelation that Delara is a spy doesn't serve much as a twist because the game is over. It only raises more questions. Going back and choosing to handle the events in London differently did nothing to quell my frustrations. If you let Brown and the delegates die, guess what? New segment. The Human Restoration Act isn't even fully confirmed to have been passed. Vega simply says that it is certain to pass, but you never get to experience that world. Letting Marchenko detonate the bombs? New segment. It's even less unclear because Vega states the delegates refused to put the act to a vote, so you can't even reasonably guess what happens. The side missions you complete, they're just summarized. And literally just that, as in you don't get to see the fruits of your effort. Let me clarify too that Miller's fate being left unknown comes as an issue unless you trigger the cutscene immediately after your conversation with Marchenko and choose to withhold the antidote from him. If you just run right away to go deal with your objectives, then you never find out what happens. Furthermore, Miller almost certainly will be written out of future titles because his fate cannot be canon. Some people chose to save him, and others didn't. As painful as the final 10 minutes of this game were for me to endure, I refuse to let it define my experience. I cannot deny that I found myself completely lost in this world, exploring the extremely finely crafted levels and using all of the movement mechanics made me feel that there was nowhere out of bounds. If there was somewhere I wanted to reach, I could conceivably get there using a little critical thinking. The feeling that Prague was alive, and I know I'm using that word a lot, but believe me, I'm not just throwing it around. It's important that an open world environment immerse you instead of just being the place where you spend all of your time. You can actually interact with these people and understand what they're going through. The dialogue is crisp, not at all contrived. You get the sense that this is what a divided future sounds like. Hell, we're basically living in a divided future and I could definitely sense these people were struggling. If you want to treat this like a shooter and spray automatic weapons and use cool augmentations to take out your enemies, then feel free. If you prefer not to hurt a soul, then knock your enemies out, or just be peaceful and do not even engage. If you want to roleplay as a cold, no bullshit cop on a mission, or want to stop and help as many people as you can, it's all available to you. Doing all of this in a cyberpunk environment oozing with style is icing on the cake, and even though the final act doesn't at all leave you with the best taste in your mouth, it's in my opinion that Deus Ex Mankind Divided is an unbelievable achievement in blending story and gameplay. Sometimes you just have to let go and embrace what you've become.